you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Hello everybody, today's video is a little bit of fun. I haven't done a five things video for absolutely ages, but being British, I do love a good rant. So today's video, five car guy sins that I think are far worse than M badges on non M cars. Honourable mention should go to people that put Brabus badges on a Mercedes, which I think is an even bolder and bigger flex. Thanks to my friend Michael for submitting this picture, and also this one, which I personally think is actually quite humorous, of a Lamborghini badge on an Abarth. The people who put a prancing moose on the side of their Volvo get a free pass though, because I think that is genuinely hilarious. Well, it makes me chuckle anyway. So then, here are my five things, and remember, this is just for a little bit of fun. Don't take any of this too seriously, barring one, and I'll tell you which one that is. We start then, not with M badges on BMWs, but instead with 007 or James Bond related paraphernalia on Aston Martins. Now, I know what you're thinking, but James, James Bond had an Aston Martin. Yes, he did, he had many of them, in fact, and if you have a DB5, you're welcome to milk the Bond connection. Same if you have a DBS, or even if you're one of the very, very few people in the world with a DB10. As it happens, the coolest Bond car of all is the 1980s Aston. I am desperate to get my hands on one of those, but they are rather rare, very pricey, and I don't think they tend to see the light of day all that often, which is a shame because I think they look marvellous. The issue is that James Bond didn't drive every Aston. The fact is that my Z3 is more of a Bond car than a DB9. Aston themselves are actually the worst for this, because if you know your car and movie history, and I'm sure many of you do, is that the Aston and Bond thing almost never happened at all. Aston Martin weren't really all that keen on helping out Eon Productions with their films. In the end, a deal was done, but it wasn't an especially favourable one. I've probably had better deals from car manufacturers than Eon did. In the books, James Bond didn't initially drive an Aston at all. He, in fact, drove a Bentley, I think. So it's a bit odd to now see Aston Martin essentially doing absolutely everything they can to try and remind people of this connection between the two. The fact is quite simple. First off, you don't need to remind everybody that James Bond drives an Aston. We all know, in the same way that Mini didn't need to put a thing in their car saying maximum go-kart feel. If you have to put it in there, then it's not really true, is it? Secondly, this near non-stop stream of stuff coming from Aston Martin, in my opinion, only really cheapens the brand. The two prime examples of this for me are the DB5 continuation thing, which yes, is a real throwback to an actual Aston car, but the fact is it's three million pounds for an oversized Corgi toy. A joke evidently not lost on Aston Martin because they placed one in London in a massive Corgi toy box, because that really is all that is. Three million pounds for a car that isn't actually road legal, and I expect just a way of fleecing a whole bunch of multi, multi-millionaires or even billionaires of a few more quid to try and sort of cover over the fact that the rest of your cars nobody is actually buying. The other example, and it pains me to say this because it's actually a very good car, is the DB9 GT, Bond edition. James Bond never even sat in a DB9. DBS, yes, could have done a Bond edition of one of those, but he did not have one. Even weirder, really, was the On Her Majesty's Secret Service edition of the DBS Superleggera, a car that pretty much nobody was buying, and they definitely weren't going to buy at £300,000. And I don't think On Her Majesty's Secret Service is a film remembered fondly enough to sort of pry open wallets any further than they already were. That was just very, very odd. So if you have an Aston, and it was one that James Bond drove, you can put 007 on the number plate if you like, but don't put it on a V8 Vantage. Don't put it on a later Vanquish, early one. That's fine. Despite it being a terrible film, James Bond did indeed drive a Vanquish. But otherwise... Every Aston Martin, not a Bond car. Sorry, I know I'm going to upset a few people with that one, but, but it's true. Enough about Aston Martin, though. For number two on my list, we're going to talk about a brand with which I'm a little bit more familiar, Ferrari. Now, you could make entire videos about Ferrari, and I have. 
and I probably will again. But they're taking up only a little bit of today's. And this is Cargaisin number two. And I would be very keen to see how many of you agree with this or disagree. I don't think it should be legal. Ignore advisable. I don't think it should be legal for anybody that owns a Ferrari to wear any Ferrari branded stuff. As I've just given the Aston lot a bit of a dig for the James Bond thing, I'm going to be perfectly fair and talk now about um, Ferrari's very interesting new clothing. Now, some of it is amazing. In fact, check out this number. I want to buy one of those. I mean, I am going to break my own rule and buy one of those shirts. I, I, look, come on, come on. I, I think you forgive me. Would you forgive me? But this, eh, uh, or this, I mean, these, these are not parodies. These are not pastiches. This is the genuine Ferrari clothing. A lot of the stuff they do is really, really quite nice. I've bought a few items for family members and, and friends and stuff, and, and it's, it's really decent. But some of it of late has gotten a little bit outlandish. Now, why is it that I think that Ferrari owners shouldn't wear Ferrari branded stuff? Well, quite simple, really. I mean, I used to buy loads and loads of Lotus stuff when I had my Lotus, and I always felt a, a little bit stupid, really, getting out of the Lotus wearing Lotus branded stuff. It got to a point, actually, where I would only wear Lotus stuff if I was not driving the Lotus. There are two threads, I suppose, to this. Uh, first off, if you own a Ferrari, you already own the best thing with a Ferrari badge on it. I love buying merchandise. I've got Aston jackets. I've got Lamborghini jackets. I've got all sorts of stuff. Card carrying tart. I think most of you know me fairly well by now. And that's all OK. But if you turn up somewhere to a Ferrari event, you know, in Ferrari gear, I think that's the equivalent of turning up at, you know, your sort of local friendly have a bit of fun go kart session in a full Nomex race suit with a Hans device on. You're taking things just a little bit too seriously. I think you run the risk of, of perhaps looking like a Wally, especially as many of the people wearing this stuff might be sort of older gentlemen and then getting out of your car head to toe and branded stuff. I don't know. I just think it's not a good look. I, that's, that is me, really. Um, the other thing is that when I started saying to people that I was actually going to be buying a Ferrari, a lot of people I knew came out of the woodwork and said to me, oh, I, I would have bought a Ferrari, but I, but I just... Yeah, I just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. And I said, well, well, why not? You know, it's not financial or anything like that. I said, no, no, I, it's the owners. I can't do it because the owners. And I think the sort of people they're referring to are these people who think that, you know, Ferrari is God. There's some truth in that, I suppose, especially if you're Italian. And that only Ferrari will do. And they want to remind everybody that they have a Ferrari. I suppose it's almost the automotive equivalent of being a vegan. We all know vegans or vegetarians who are perfectly decent, nice, normal, honest people. They're really chill, really easygoing. And I know a lot of Ferrari owners that fit that description. Chill and easygoing, not vegan, although I'm sure they're out there as well. No, what I'm talking about here is the people that you know are vegan because they've told you. In the same way that, you know, you don't want someone sort of walking up to you going, hey, I drive a Ferrari. And they probably do it in that voice as well. To me, wearing the clothing is basically just a way of trying to tell everybody you own a Ferrari. So if you just like Ferrari and for whatever reason you, you can't have one, you want to buy some shirts and stuff, support the brand and everything, knock yourself out. Go for it. Do it. Honestly, please. I've bought loads of branded stuff over the time. I get no problem with it whatsoever. I love it. Card carrying tarp, said it before, we'll say it again. But Ferrari stuff in particular, I don't know, I just have a bit of an issue with it. I haven't even actually joined the Ferrari Owners Club. I'm in the Lamborghini Owners Club. Don't have a Lamborghini anymore. I'm in the TVR Owners Club. I've never owned a TVR. I've been in the club for about six years. The magazine they do is, is brilliant. Uh, I'm in lots of other owners clubs, but just not the Ferrari Owners Club. I, I probably should join it at some point, but... It's just one of these things. I don't know. I think we need to make the image of Ferrari owners a little bit more approachable, a little bit more down to earth. Remind people that ultimately all these are our cars. That's all they are. And this leads me directly onto point number three. If you have a nice car, a flashy, showy car, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Porsche, Nissan GTI, anything, and it can be legitimately anything. Up to and including my Citroen BX. I get this little Citroen BX GTI on the driveway. I haven't made any videos about it yet. I know I'm terrible. I will at some point soon. And some of the delivery drivers that come to the house and, and you know, the people that deliver pizza and stuff like that, they don't care about the Ferraris. But the Citroen, they love. The Celica, they love. So if you have a nice car, you have a sworn solemn duty 
where possible, and I understand it's not always possible, to entertain people with it, to let them take photos, let them have a sit in it. It's just a car. I've been to so many shows and things where you see people have brought a car out and then they essentially want to erect a little picket fence around it so nobody can go near it. I, I don't get that. If you have a car and you don't want to drive it, you don't want to use it and it's stored in a barn, I can kind of get over that. Fine. I don't like it, but fine. But don't take the car out and not expect people to adore it, to admire it, to want to talk to you about it. They're not being pests. They're just being people. They're being lovable. They're being adorable. I have seen some real, genuine, heartwarming, tearjerker moments involving the simple act, just, you know, letting somebody enjoy and appreciate your car. It takes so little time and yet means so very much to so very many people. I still swap stories about things that happened when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16, you know, and I, I spotted a challenge to Dali in town one day. Oh my word, amazing. I saw a noble on the way home from school once, which is the best thing ever. I didn't stop talking about it for two weeks. A noble, amazing. These are the kind of little moments, the little memories that can really change somebody's life, can really inspire somebody to go on and do something interesting, exciting, whatever, even if they go and do the job they were always going to do. But because of you, because of that one thing, because of that one day, that one time, they got to sit in your car. They then worked hard enough. They can go and buy one for themselves or rub the bank and bought one or something like that. Just, you know, let's just be nice with the cars. We don't know how long they're going to be around for, so let's try and use them to do as much good as we possibly can in the time that we have it. This is a topic I know I've raised in many other videos, and I will not stop doing it because I believe it is right. Next up, and this is the only one, the, the only one on this list that actually really bothers me, like, like lit legitimately, genuinely bothers me. And this is Porsche people who try and tell you how to pronounce Porsche. The correct pronunciation is Porsche. It is a German name. It is a German family name. This is the reason that Porsche people give. My counter argument is this. In fact, my usual counter argument when anybody says, don't you know how to pronounce Porsche, is, wenn die Amis Jagdjahrrichtig sagen, dann sage ich Porsche richtig. Which is very bad German for when the Yanks start saying Jaguar properly, and by the way, the correct pronunciation for that is Jag, then I'll say Porsche properly. Because almost invariably, it is Americans that say this. In fact, I've met Americans whose first thing they've ever said to me is, it's Porsche, not Porsche. And yeah, it's Renault, not Renault. Citroën, not Citroën. It's Lamborghini or Ferrari or one of many, many other names that they also don't get right. In fact, some of them they get comically wrong. It's not a Jaguar. It's definitely not a Jaguar. I don't even know what a Jaguar is. It's a Jag. The fact is, though, when I say Porsche or anyone says Porsche or even Tony from Gravelwood says Porsche, which is a very, very distinct and specific pronunciation, we all know what everyone means, don't we? We all know what everyone said. It wasn't like I said, it's a poo. What is it? It's a poo. It's, it's a what? It's a poo. 911 Carrera S. Oh, a Porsche. You meant a Porsche. Oh, you know what I'm saying. The fact is, you phone up Porsche headquarters here. They'll probably say, hello, Porsche. They won't say, it's Porsche, you scum. Now get out and learn how to say it properly before you even dare to darken our doorstep ever again. All you achieve by telling people how to pronounce Porsche is that, first off, you're a bit of a dick. Sorry, but it's true. Secondly, you're not particularly inclusive, welcoming. You're, in fact, quite combative. And this is also the entire antithesis of what I was just talking about. Cars should be inclusive, warm, welcoming, lovely, enjoyable, friendly. The first thing you do to anybody is tell them that they've said the name of the car brand wrong. You're just not a person that I'm probably going to get on with. That's just as simple as that. Never, not in my life, not once, not ever have I heard anybody tell you how to pronounce Ferrari, Renault, Peugeot, Citroen, Lamborghini, BMW. Never, not 
forever. And by the way, some of those companies, it is somebody's name. You know, Renault was Louis Renault. But you don't get told by the French you're pronouncing it wrong. No French person has ever said to me, I'm pronouncing Renault wrong, because they know what I'm talking about, as do Germans. No German has ever told me I'm doing it wrong. Brits do, and Americans do. Very odd. Don't know quite what's going on there. But that one does wind me up, because it's just not necessary. It's not nice, ultimately. Um, it's, it's a car. Get over it. Finally, and this is more a, 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 an annoyance. It doesn't upset me in the same way that I'm sure you can tell the Porsche Porsche thing does. I actually made a whole video on that as well, which I thought was hilarious, but unbiased. The final one. This is a very recent development. In the last, actually, two years specifically, I get a lot of people coming to me asking about advice for cars, what cars to buy. And this is absolutely fine. Um, generally speaking, if you're going to do that, by the way, say hello and say, could I ask you something first, rather than sending me two paragraphs of stuff. It, it, it's, it's helpful, it's nice, it's pleasantries. I'm British, we get on better if somebody says lots and lots of stuff that means nothing before you ask the actual question. Strange, but true. Brits will all confirm this. What's really puzzled me lately is I've got a lot of people coming to me, oddly, often in relation to Porsche stuff, and they want advice on the best car to sell. Not to buy, but they are buying it, but they want to know the best car to buy to sell. They don't necessarily want to make money on this, although some of these people, I think, assume that that can happen, and cars, as everyone has watched any of my videos will know, I don't believe in buying as a financial investment. But people now have become so obsessed with the spec, and don't get me started on people who call the colour combo the spec. It's the colour combo. Like, can we go back to the old days, please, of not having life hacks, can we have tips? Life hacks, incidentally, tend to be absolutely useless. Now, I'm not going to clean my bathroom with a lime rather than some pledge. Have you seen the cost of fruit these days? No. Um, and so, with fake news. I hate fake news. It's either the news or it's bull. It's one of these two things. Fake news, just uh, no, no, no. Fake news is the Daily Mash, you know, or something like that. You know, uh, what was the one with Chris Morris in? The Day to Day. The Day to Day is fake news. <laughs> That's the only kind of fake news I'm going to uh, accept. If you don't know what the day-to-day -day is, um, go watch it or listen to it or whatever. I'm uh, On the hour, that was the radio one. Go watch the day-to-day. -day. Uh, don't watch it with the kids. Don't watch it with the kids. So people now seem to think that you can go and buy a car, and they're so obsessed now, so obsessed with the exact specification. What's it going to have? What do people want? And all we've done is create a few things. You'll notice several, I didn't realise, but I should have really sort of done, you know, point A and point B here, because half of these things seem to have a couple of different strands. First up, what you wind up with is a sea of identical cars. So take 911 GT3. You want a nice, easy sellable colour. You want bucket seats. You want the cage in it. You want the fire extinguisher. You want the lift. You want the Bose. Anything else is now unsellable. Now, it may be the case that not all of these cars actually need all of these things. But we've got in this situation now where if you want to try and sell anything that isn't the spec, good luck to you. And this means when people are buying cars, they're no longer buying them for themselves. They're instead buying what the market or their dealer is telling them to, because it'll be much easier a few years down the line to get rid. And quite honestly, if you're buying a car simply with a view of how easy is this going to be to get shot of, uh, don't buy it. Just don't buy it. Buy the car you're happy with. Buy the car you want. And when it comes to some of the larier colour combinations, I know a lot of people get a little bit uneasy. You know, should I buy that car with the purple exterior and the bronze leather and Alcantara interior? Yeah, you should. Yeah, you should. Because A, it's banging, and B, it'll probably be the only one out there. And when you do come to sell it, it will stand out. Maybe, maybe the audience for a car like that will be a little bit smaller. But also, they're going to be people that will only want to buy that car. A friend of mine was looking at GT3s recently, and the issue with all of them is you look at the specs and they nearly all look exactly the same. Every now and again, one suddenly stands out. Like buying an Aston, talked about it in a recent video with a Virage. They're all more or less the same. And this means it's very difficult when you're trying to buy a car to go, that's the one I want. The other really sad thing, and this is the bit people sort of want to ignore deliberately, is the a key part of having a super desirable car now, especially with GT3s, things like that, is um, mileage. So the best and most effective way of making sure your car doesn't lose any money is to not drive it. 
which when you're talking about some of the best driver's cars in the world, makes no sense to me. Look at the mileage on old Porsches. Look at the mileage on 993s and things like that. They've all got miles on because people drove them. They weren't worried about it. They weren't thinking four or five years down the line, what's my investment going to look like? They were loving their cars. Don't be that person that bought a brilliant, fantastic, amazing example of one of the best driver's cars that we have ever known, only to then put about 400 miles in a year on it because you are afraid of what you're going to do to the values. Guess what? Nice cars are expensive. One way or the other, they will find a way of relieving you of some cash. Instead, stop worrying about that. Get out there and enjoy your cars. That, I think, kind of covers it. If you've got any other sort of fun pet hates, don't get too serious in the comments, please do let me know. We'll all have a bit of a joint laugh. We'll share our funny stories. And um, I hope to see you all for the next video. A big thank you again to everybody who subscribed recently. We just passed the 200k mark. Incredible. Haven't got anything to show for it. Still got another 800,000 to go until I get another plaque out of YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed already, please do. Thanks for watching, comment down below, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.